Welcome to the Baptist Broadcast. We've got a special program for you today. I have a uh, guest on with me here in a moment. We'll go ahead and switch over to that, but just by way of uh, quick introduction, I will be interviewing today Pastor Steve Meister, pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church over in Sacramento, California, along with uh, Pastor Robert Briggs as well. Uh, those two gentlemen have a podcast called Particularly Baptist, and I didn't mention this in the interview, um, and I, I didn't really, unfortunately, give Steve an opportunity to mention it uh, either, but they have a helpful podcast. Uh, they've, they've just recently um, dropped an episode that's, that's very helpful titled Something Close to Confessionalism. Again, it's called Particularly Baptist, and you can find that on uh, iTunes, I believe. There's also particularlybaptist.com. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this interview. This interview is about the importance of confessionalism. We talk a little bit about Steve's experience, his background, um, and the importance of not only the doctrines of grace, not only the doctrine of Scripture, um, but the importance of confessing the whole counsel of God. So glad you're joining us. Hope you enjoy. Well, we are here with a special guest today, Pastor Steve Meister, who is pastor out in Sacramento, California, Emmanuel Baptist Church there. Spelt with an I, right, Steve? That's right. Emmanuel. All right. Yeah, Emmanuel Baptist Church out in Sacramento. And uh, and 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 we're here to talk about um, some pretty important stuff. We, uh, we both have uh, come to a more firm commitment, I guess you could say, um, in terms of confessionalism. Uh, and, and we, we both hold, um, the importance in high regard of understanding what we confess so that we can confess it with a good conscience. But we're really here today to talk about, um, mostly about S Steve's end of things. And, and uh, because he's got a really uh, interesting um, uh, kind of um, trajectory uh, historically in terms of how he came to uh, understand uh, the importance of confessionalism, but the background that goes along with that and, and kind of what he came out of, I think is relevant. And it's probably going to map not only to my own experience, but I would imagine to, to the experience of those uh, who are watching as well. So, Steve, I'm going to give you a little bit of, of time here to, to, to expand upon that introduction a little bit. Just, just tell people more about yourself, and, um, and then we'll talk about kind of your background um, and, and move on from there. So if you can just kind of give a, a lay of the land concerning who you are uh, to the listeners, the watchers, that'd be, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Josh. It's good to be with you. I appreciate the work you're doing here and, and elsewhere and getting to know you. Uh, and I also really appreciate that you use the word trajectory rather than journey or story. Um, if this if this discussion goes that direction, I'm out right away. Um, uh, but the Lord has been, I think, very kind uh, and gracious uh, beyond all expectation in my life and both bringing me to himself by faith in Christ and giving me the mercy of being in ministry and uh, serving his the saints. Um, and just the, there is a definite trajectory in a commitment to both rightly understand and to minister his word. Uh, I'm currently a pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church, as you mentioned, in Sacramento, alongside my fellow pastor, Robert Briggs, and the other brothers that serve with us there. We're grateful to be here in the capital of a very blue state and to stand uh, for Christ and his word. And according to what we confess in the Second London Confession, I certainly didn't start there. Um, my uh, introduction to the faith uh, was at a, a, a church in the California coast in Monterey County and would be described now, and I would have had a category then uh, for a seeker-driven type of approach to ministry. Uh, it, not a healthy situation, but the Lord was very kind in his mercies to uh, expose me to the gospel, to be, bring me to himself and to God's word. Um, I realized early on uh, that our congregation where we were um, and where I came to faith um, was not settled on biblical authority or even the importance of understanding scripture. And just in my own studies, I was just your a story that probably maps with yours, as you mentioned, and many others reading God's word, listening to just Christian radio, going to Christian bookstores. This is before um, showing a little bit of my age. This is before you could go to websites and find sound theological stuff. I mean, we were just on our own. The internet was not a thing that you, you went to for anything serious. Um, and so uh, just in that sense of 
desperation in some ways and confusion. Um, I got involved in what now we would know as an identify at that time, and this is in the uh, early mid nineties of uh, the emerging church movement. So I spent some time uh, literally in the congregation where the book, the emerging church was written by the, the lead pastor at the time. Uh, very grateful for uh, the desire to be real and to be serious uh, according to God's word, obviously tons of confusion as well in that movement. And I was there, um, did the very, uh, did the coffee shop church thing, did the, uh, um, you know, musical experience, all, all that stuff, been there, done that. And, and God's kindness was part of a church plant that was somewhat in that same vein uh, in college where the Lord was kind to sort of confirm both my, uh, the gifting and graces and desires for ministry. And so got married uh, in that context and then went to seminary, uh, to the master's seminary, and was just felt like I had finally come home, that there was finally a setting where God's word was being rightly upheld as authoritative, and that understanding it mattered for our lives and for our growth in Christ and for others. And so it was just nothing but a, uh, the introduction to TMS and my time there um, was a wonderful blessing, giving me tools to read and study uh, God's word. Um, however, though, looking backwards, especially at this, this is now, you know, 15 to 20 years ago at this point, um, looking backwards, 15 years uh, would be closer to true. Um, looking at, there were also some tensions that were, I identified early on that I didn't have categories for, uh, but they began to unravel in ways that eventually led me to confessing the second London um, years after I entered vocational pastoral ministry and um, had uh, left seminary. Um, and, and I look back on it now and, and where I, if there's any Genesis, um, I see it in my first semester when I was enrolled both in a class on hermeneutics and historical theology. And I loved historical theology and I had never been exposed to and read um, Athanasius and the reformers and Owen. Um, and I'm reading these guys and reading Calvin and just loving it. Um, and it was coinciding with other works I was reading by brothers like Jim Boyce and R.C. Sproul that were quoting these guys. And I'm just devouring this and enjoying their both approach to scripture and their depth of theology and tying things together for our worship and our, our, our witness and our, and our life in Christ. But then I would go to my hermeneutics class and learn that none of these men apparently knew how to read the Bible. <laughs> and that tension was, um, I didn't know what to do with it uh, at the time. Uh, the, and it, it just began, I think, a, a, a querying on my part, an investigation of that eventually led me to what I believe to be a correct confessional position today. Um, but that tension that would resolve in my mind later of, we're receiving the doctrines of the church down through the Reformation to post-Reformation in our day, but questioning the means by which those men arrived at those doctrines. Mm. Um, and that, I think, is still a tension that's present even in confessional circles, and we can maybe talk about that later. Um, but that, that began to open up questions as I was still going into my studies there. Um, and I think, you know, to reduce a complicated conversation to a simple point, um, the inviolable law of biblical interpretation and hermeneutics that we were given, that I believed and, and didn't see any other way around, um, was that what the human author intended and what the original readers of scripture, we're talking about scriptural authors, what the biblical authors in, must have intended and what the original readers uh, understood according to their place in history and culture is the meaning of scripture. Um, and it must be conditioned by that. Um, and that me meant commitments to things like um, what's been written in, in, in Walt Kaiser's toward an exegetical theology, and that we don't take, uh, we don't take later revelation into consideration when we're interpreting any given passage. So when we read, um, you know, things in Genesis, like Genesis three, uh, we don't think about what Paul and later authors would have understood. We only think what Moses must have meant and what the original Israelites mm -hmm. would have received from that. Yeah. Um, and so that was, that was bedrock and and the other hermeneutical principles unfolded from that and that that created another nagging feeling um that 
you know, the, the rules for reading scripture didn't come from scripture. And so right. despite our, you know, insistence on biblical authority, biblical sufficiency, biblical clarity, all of those truths, and, and those, are, those are badges of honor, right? And those are, you know, hills we die on. But our method of reading scripture didn't come from scripture. We talked about yeah. things like Mortimer Adler and how to read a book. Um, and it, it, some of those tensions, again, were, were, were being raised in my mind of um, uh, uh, if you don't need the Holy Spirit to read scripture, what are, what are we doing? If we're getting principles outside of scripture, where did those come from? in order to understand how to read scripture. Um, and again, I didn't have answers for all of them, but there were questions that were being raised and they would unfold later when I was ministering in the same context as a pastor. And I would have questions from church members like, you know, if Isaiah was just writing to Israelites and it was primarily about his promises to Israel, then why even bother reading it? You know, what does it have to do right. with us? Right. Um, now, now, of course, brothers have answers for that. And, and I don't want to paint anyone into sort of a, a, a straw man corner, but I do think, that even those kind of simplistic questions are raising the reality of tensions in um, a, you know, a dispensational biblicist background. Um, and, and that's, that's how I would understand it now. There, there's, there's presuppositions that I was given that were unconscious and were unquestioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of them that was often, you know, repeated was dispensationalism is a hermeneutic, not a theology. And it just was, unrecognized how that was a tautology that that our theology is our hermeneutic um yeah. and that's an inescapable circle um and it's only when we make actually our theology plain and our first principles self-conscious that they can actually be chastened according to scripture that we can examine mm -hmm. them and that we can we can correct them and, and and challenge them or confirm them from god's word um so those were some of the 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 early tensions in my studies that began to unfold and in hindsight, I, I recognize other things. We had no courses on biblical theology, none. Um, there was, I, I think that's indicative of a, a reticence to see continuity in the Bible. And that if we're, if we're going to embrace the assumption that, um, that the meaning of scripture is uh, solely what we believe a human author would have intended, and what the what we believe the original readers only could have understood, that's going to inject necessary um, separations in the corpus of scripture between the authors, between the books. We're going to resist continuity. We're going to resist seeing uh, patterns. If they do show up, we shrug them off mm. as well. Yeah. It's just you know, it's coincidental. Um, doesn't mean there's anything uh, uh, continuous going on. And. And now it seems as, as plain as day is that we're ignoring the fact that scripture comes from God and there's one author at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, but, but at that time it was just, that was the commitment and that's the box that we were reasoning in. That was the grid through which we, we, we were given to look at scripture. Um, now maybe there were good qualifications. Again, I don't want to try to malign any of former professors or all well-intended godly brothers. Um, but, but I think there's some, uh, irreconcilable tensions there with what we see in scripture itself. And that would later then just unfold for me in pastoral ministry when I was actually working in scripture. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're working in, in a similar background uh, kind of to my own experience, but it's interesting because my own experience is years after what you're talking about. Um, so we're talking about like, I don't know, eight years ago, um, seven years ago, I'm experiencing a lot of the same things where, you know, your, your New Testament and your Old Testament survey courses um, are like 50-50, right? The, the first 50% is like background studies, uh, mm -hmm. things that you, you wouldn't be able to, like if you were, a, you know, if you were like a 12th century, you know, monk and you picked up the Psalms, uh, these are these background studies include things that you would never be able to to know, right. and and then the meaning of the Psalms now hinges on these background studies that you know Christians for the greater life of the New Testament Church would not have been able to have access to would not have, would not have would not have known, and so for all the for all the talk of sufficiency of Scripture today, um, there's certainly a lot of what seems to be um, making the meaning of scripture contingent to that which is outside of itself. 
oh yeah and uh, or contingent upon that which is outside of itself and um it's it's just an interesting kind of irony uh i think that that's there it's like you said there's a there's a tension there um that i think uh, can't be reconciled now um you you've given uh a, a kind of a uh, an overview of of your background now in terms of kind of emerging out of that you know when was you know as all that's going on uh how how did you encounter maybe i should just say reformed theology maybe it was the doctrines of grace maybe it's reformed baptist theology i don't yeah. know but but what was your first encounter with something more solid more doctrinal scriptural uh you know um more reformed yeah I, well i think it it continued through seminary and into later studies i was always far more interested in reading um you know banner of truth authors than i was um those in the dispensational camp uh they just the 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 latter just struck me as as stiff as mechanical um as uh, uh it didn't have a, a theological depth in my in my opinion um and so i would read these other guys and and just living in that constant tension of of um having these hermeneutical principles that none of my heroes shared and i i, I loved their doctrinal conclusions and their ministry um, but i didn't quite understand uh how they got there and so i sort of set out on a project myself to try to um, stay committed to my hermeneutical foundations, um, and yet vindicate, justify the theology that I thought was better and good. Um, uh, I, we, I didn't have much exposure to covenant theology. Uh, I was told, in fact, that it was a step to Roman Catholicism and pedo baptism um, uh, to embrace that. And so I, I didn't understand the variety of covenant theologies through history, the historical. I mean, there was no exposure to that at all or even discussion. It was just like you're, you're, you've made a step towards uh, Rome, which is a kind of a, a, a lazy accusation that continues to get repeated, unfortunately. Um, and the commitment that i did have was that your exegetical method will guarantee orthodoxy um and then i started to realize well that can't be the case because there were guys who had the same uh, the uh exegetical commitments that i had that were arriving at what i understood to be erroneous conclusions and so after i left seminary i served in a, a a christian uh relief organization for a couple of years and did work writing curriculum and doing some different things there um and i entered pastoral ministry in a in a, a dear congregation uh that's nearby i still have a great affection for in the same tradition that i had come out of in seminary and it was really then in the the cauldron of real pastoral ministry i stepped in then as an associate pastor that uh a lot of these tensions then began to unfold um things working through scripture and what what eventually began to undo uh dispensationalism for me and the hermeneutical grid i was given was actually not the you know what's common to point to the old testament or the new testament use of the old but for me it was the old testament use of the old and i i started preaching and and studying the minor prophets and looking at how they use torah and mm -hmm. looking at the um ways that the divine author was unfolding meaning from moses in micah and malachi um, started to raise questions for me about the grid i'd been given and how um uh human and, and what we think human intention meant uh would govern uh would govern all the meaning and so that began a process in those in those uh studies um and and then also just the the fires of of um pastoral ministry and the frustration with how limited our resources were, or I mean, maybe a, really a better way to say it is, I was cognizant that we seem to be reinventing the wheel a lot. Mm. I mean, when things came up in the church, when things came up pastorally, well, what do we think about this? And it's not, I mean, it's not quite true that we said we had open at Genesis and start over, but I felt that way. And I felt like we were grasping at straws and I remember one point in particular in seminary or excuse me, in ministry, um, this is later in ministry thinking, man, why didn't the Lord give us more to do ministry? And then I immediately in that sense of sort of frustration, lament that 
thought, well, that's absurd. I mean, right away, uh, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit convicted me that that was a, that was a dumb thought. Um, and then I, it raised the issue that, well, maybe how we're approaching scripture, how I'm approaching scripture is inconsistent and isn't what the Lord intended. And that really set me then on a, uh, I almost said journey and I caught myself, <laughs> uh, sent me, that sent me on an, uh, a quest <laughs> uh, uh, continuing, <laughs> continuing my trajectory of wanting to understand what the Lord means for his church and how we are to minister. And so I started digging into um, older guys in the area of ecclesiology in particular. And so even though today we know in, in at least the wider discussions, theology proper is a hot button, um, what the the gateway for me into confessional theology and a better hermeneutic was ecclesiology. Mm -hmm. And so I was reading Bannerman, Church of Christ. And of course, um, his approach, I started reading uh, older Baptist theologies. I was introduced through by that. Um, it's out of print right now. I'm told there's a new edition coming, but it was published by Nine Marks, Polity, edited by Mark Dever. That's a collection chronologically of mm -hmm. older Baptist polities. It's a wonderful resource. You can still get the PDF online. Uh, of it. And I'm reading these guys and reading uh, what, how they're formulating doctrine of the church according to scripture. And they're not reading scripture and they're not coming to conclusions the way that I was instructed in seminary and the hermeneutic I was given. And so pennies started dropping that the Lord has sufficiently given us instruction according to his word. It's just that we have been put these blinders on with our hermeneutic that comes outside of scripture that would come to find out with later study and reflection actually comes from the enlightenment. It comes mm. from modernist assumptions. And despite our uh, right um, objection to enlightenment modernist principles and treating scripture as just a human product, uh, we were unaware of how much that of that well we'd actually drunk and how mm -hmm. much it had influenced how we were reading scripture. And when you skipped over that or when you went uh, into authors that were more self-conscious of that and speaking against that, a whole world opened up of um, reading scripture, not only with what's expressly set, but also what's necessarily contained within it. Um, and so that's really when uh, like I said, pennies were dropping for me in um, thinking through the doctrine of the church in a uh, more historic confessional frame. Um, I also started reading biblical theology, and I was reading um, guys who were pointing out continuity that began to be um, just unavoidable for me. And notable was really how the Apostle Paul, one of my favorite books of scripture and areas I love to keep studying is second Corinthians and how the apostle Paul uses the old Testament in second Corinthians is just not dispensational <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and it doesn't work. Um, especially when he, in, in, in the arc from chapter six and a real high point from chapter six into seven, when he cites uh, Leviticus and Exodus and Isaiah and Deuteronomy and says, since we have these promises, beloved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was like, you know, like a bomb went off in my hermeneutical mind of terms of, um, wow, how I understand the relationship of the Old and New Testaments is, I don't think, consistent with Scripture. And I mm -hmm. think that if we're going to learn biblical interpretation interpretation from anybody, we should be learning from the apostles. Um, and if we believe in the Lordship of Christ um, and we want to submit and obey His Lordship in all things, that should include how we read His Word. Um, and so, those kinds of things were happening really all at the same time. Um, I was in the middle, actually, funny enough, I was in the middle of a sermon, a sermon series on Ezekiel, and I had to stop because I was going to start saying things that uh, were not consistent with, you know, the, the tradition of the church that I was in and uh, the, those commitments. And so um, that, that brought me into a place where I was then ready to explore outside of the the education and tradition I was given. I had gotten a copy of, you know, Chapel Library does the copies yep. of the 1689. I'd gotten one of those at a shepherd's conference. Uh, I pulled that out and began reading it. And then Banner of Truth, um, I can't remember what year this was now. Um, this had to have been, you know, before 2010 or thereabouts. Um, Banner of Truth put out a, uh, a gift edition of the Second London Confession 1689 a little, uh, a little 
leather like copy and uh my wife got it for me for christmas and that was she laughs is like well that was you know i just you know set her world in turmoil in terms of where i would go then <laughs> vocationally and everything is is giving me that but i just devoured it and i loved the um theological depth the consistency with what i was understanding now the continuity of scripture the fact that you could affirm the single purpose of god in covenant theology and not baptize babies um that was <laughs> That was radical. I thought, yeah. I, I, I thought this was on, on our way to Rome, pedo baptism. It turns out n- not at all. Um, the and, pastoral, and, and it's and it's and it's integral in the defense of credo baptism, which right. is is what a, a lot of you know um, modern Baptists don't understand is that ye, this battle is is fought on the ground of the covenant, and oh, yeah. uh, not on the not on the etymology of the word baptizo or something like that. Yeah. And I think, and, and now good brothers are doing good work on that. Right. But more work needs to be done. And, and what I will often tell guys that, that ask about, I said, look, our, our fight is really about what's new about the new covenant, Mm. not about, you know, household and acts or, or these kinds of things. I think we need to have those conversations, but um, I, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. And so that's what that was going on as I was reading that um, and was being so encouraged and edified and just the, really the pastoral wisdom of our confessional tradition, um, that they were actually, uh, there's whole chapters on, um, assurance and saving faith and, um, uh, issues that mattered in the church and the, the wisdom that sometimes we've forgotten, um, that pastors and teachers and Christians in the er the ages prior to us have worked out for the good of the church. Uh, I had a conversation, you know, much later with a brother uh, who reflected, who is in a, a dispensational tradition, and he reflected on how the, the statement of faith of their church had one paragraph on salvation and had a half a page or more on eschatology. And he said, you know, that just seems like a bit imbalanced. Yeah. And I just yeah. encouraged him. I said, yeah, I keep pulling on that thread, brother. Keep pulling on that thread. Um, and it is significant we, where you see in the history of the church and in, you know, the second London and Westminster and other confessions, how Christians have rightly ordered, uh, eschatological convention convictions versus soteriological ones and, mm. and where we put the emphasis and why, um, and even according what I believe to the measure of light we have in scripture. So, um, that, that was happening personally for me as, uh, as a pastor and I also was a part of a uh, pastor's fraternal here in Sacramento that was hosted at the church I'm now at Emmanuel Baptist. And um, uh, Robert Briggs uh, was the chair and he had become a friend. Um, and so we were just friends um, for several years going to the fraternal. We would have, you know, a monthly meeting and somebody would bring either a paper they prepared or an article and we'd discuss it. And those were really sharpening times of interacting with brothers in, in Presbyterian and Reformed denominations, and, and of course myself and other just across and seeing the in a in a brotherly way, in a loving way, seeing the discussions and debate going on. Um, and so that was again exposing me to other authors and traditions and writers. And so eventually, at at one point, um, I had made a commitment to. Um, uh, be at the church I was at for a certain number of years. And when that had come and I had moved theologically and I, and I told the, the elders that I, I I could no longer really um, with good conscience traffic in our statement of faith and minister according to it. And they were very loving and, and, and wise with that. Of course, I never said anything publicly to disrupt the the peace or unity of that congregation. And we were just working with a, a proper tradition tradition transition and I look back on it I think it was done in a very loving and wise and a good way um and I I reached out to Robert and said hey you know what I'm been doing all these studies um I've I've been reading through the confession I'm pretty sure I've become a reformed baptist um are you aware of any you know opportunities for minister ministry uh do you have suggestions um I I was sort of a man without a country at that point because I was Mm -hmm. leaving the tradition I had been in and the opportunities for ministry and cooperation and so many other ways. And I knew almost no one in the, in the other uh, tradition. And at that same time in God's providence, the uh, other pastor at Emmanuel uh, was looking to actually go to another opportunity as well. And so a long story short, the Lord brought me to minister here at IBC where I am and where I am now uh, 
a little over eight years ago uh, as a co-pastor with Robert. And um, it's been just a, a blessing uh, beyond belief to uh, a minister in a sweet congregation that cares about God's word, the honor of Christ, ministering to the lost here in our very blue state, um, and yet to do so very anchored tightly to our confession. Um, and so that's sort of how that process happened in uh, my exposure. And then obviously, once I um, you know, connected with Rob more overtly in an open up a world of connections and studies about our tradition um, and uh, reading uh, uh, Michael Haken's classic Kiffin, Nollis and Keach and mm. um, getting a better perspective of uh, where we're situated. And it's really just been a continued trajectory and deepening uh, really what it means to be confessional and the place our confession has in our interpretation and ministry and theology and, and what have you. For sure. And I'm sure uh, the listeners, viewers can can resonate with a lot of this. You know, those who have uh, have have kind of similar quests, uh, trajectories um, <laughs> can can probably resonate with a lot of this. Um, uh, you know, just just over the last few months, you know, with the doctrine of God stuff going on and and, uh, you know, confessionalism, you know, kind of at, at the center of it. Uh, what do we confess and why? Um, you know, I've had guys message me and, and say things to the effect of, you know, this or that reason is why I'm no longer in this place. You know, so um, I know that a lot of uh, that a lot of people who listen to this who probably probably are, are tracking here in a lot of ways. Not, in, you know, everybody, everybody's situation is a little bit different, but um, uh, but it's encouraging to hear, um, especially within the context of ministry. Uh, how this happened, and and it, and it goes to show that it's okay if you're if you're in ministry, it's okay. It's not only okay, but it's necessary that if you uh, if you continue to learn, and and we we all ought to continue to learn. We're all learning. Um, it's o- it's okay to you know it's okay to to move to progress yeah. to uh, to mature. And um, I think there's there's pressure sometimes on guys to uh, kind of just remain where they are uh, because they're a, they're not so sure what would happen if they were to admit that they've been wrong for the last, I don't know, several years. And so, um, you know, that plays into it as well. Uh, but now we come to a more, uh, I guess, um, dogmatic or, or theoretical section of, of the outline um, here and, and the interview. And, and I just want to get your thoughts on, on, what the definition of confessionalism would be or or how would you describe that to someone who is 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 asking what does it mean to be confessional yeah uh, that's a good question before i answer that i just want to you know piggyback off something you just said and um about moving and maturing in ministry and how it doesn't necessarily mean that you're completely divorcing yourself from everything the Lord has done. Mm. Uh, you know, if I go all the way back to when I came to faith in Christ in 94, um, I have appreciation for every person the Lord has used in that, in my life up to this point. And I see myself as it were standing on their shoulders, even where I have now come to principal differences. So coming to a principal difference is not the same as repudiating somebody uh, or their input. And certainly right. I would never do that of my background. I have many brothers that disagree with me uh, to this day. I love them. They love Christ and his word, and they're seeking to minister faithfully according to the light he has given them. Um, I pray for them to give him, to give them more light. Um, <laughs> they do the same for me and that's okay. Uh, yeah. And so I think that's important to, to set that out. Um, I think, you know, to your, to your question about what is confessionalism? Uh, sometimes just to, to put it simply, um, and there's many ways we can come at this, uh, I think it would be to recognize that just as God intends for Christians to have a pastor who teaches them his word, um, the Bible did not fall from the sky to any Christian's feet last week um, so that they could read it independently and come to their own conclusions. Um, so just as that is true, and I think most Christians by even just a, a, 
a rudimentary exposure to scripture recognize that they need teachers. So does every teacher and every church. And then you could even think of it as an, a widening concentric circle of those who are instructing us and whose shoulders we stand on. And if we believe in the presence of our risen savior, and I, and I know we do, if we're Christians, we do. And we believe that his spirit is with his church. Then we have to believe that he has been gifting and giving teachers to his church from whom we are to benefit and from whom we are to uh, learn. That in no way supplants the authority of God's word in any regard. Uh, the final authority and arbiter of truth uh, for faith and practice for us is scripture, period. The only unerring authority is scripture, period. But we are not the first ones to read it. And we are not unerring. Uh, we are not um, uh, without uh, need of instruction. And so just as uh, just as Christians need pastors, pastors need uh, pastors and churches need instructors. And so yeah. confessionalism is making that plain. Now, I don't think I said anything that any of my non-confessional brothers would disagree with. Um, I think they would all recognize that. I don't have any friends that I know that are crass, individualists, and self-consciously rejecting um, any need for instruction. However, we can be um, slide into that unconsciously, as it were, and not being uh, uh, self-aware of really what that means. And I think confessionalism is that statement. I read an article, one of the, in my trajectory, one of the essays that sort of was pivotal at a key time was Carl Truman's. It was a, it was a blog post on Reformation 21, uh, no good creed goes, un goes unpunished. And he, in that talked about um, the significance of creeds to instruct us and to make plain what we believe according to scripture. And he pointed out something that I hadn't thought of before of how it was a mark of humility. And it was actually an exaltation of scripture's authority because I'm now making a distinction between uh, what scripture says and what I believe scripture says and what I say uh, according to it. And that we're actually not con no longer conflating the Bible with my authority. Right. And if, if, if I see anything in non-confessional circles and sadly, in some confessional circles, it's an inability to make that distinction. Yeah. And it yeah. lends itself to arrogance. It lends itself to authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. um, it lends itself to conflating um, your convictions with scripture in such a way that you de-church other Christians. Yeah. Um, looking in hindsight, I recognize how much of that was apparent in my circles where if someone took a different view on uh, different aspects of theology. Well, then that's probably because they're just not saved. Because right, if you were right. saved, you would obviously believe, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, and I think a lot of those uh, tendencies are fed by an anti-confessional bias. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean I think everybody's non-confessional is a arrogant jerk. I, I don't think that. But there is a there is a movement, and there's a uh, there's a current that pushes you those directions. Um, and it becomes very difficult to maintain a, a humble uh, reception of what scripture teaches. Um, so I think that's confessionalism is the, um, of course, a more, maybe more formal definition is that it's a subordinate standard that governs the, the, the church or association of churches or however your ecclesiology um, has you situated. Um, that that distinguishes scripture from what you believe scripture to mean by what it says, mm -hmm. and it's articulating that, and it becomes then a a um, a articulation of what you believe the rule of faith to be, what scripture means by what it says. Uh, I mean, when the Bible says uh, the whole counsel of God, the faith, um, uh, uh, what's taught, the teaching in 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 First Timothy to Titus, those kind of phrases. What what do we what does that mean? What mm -hmm. what do we think it means? we're all going to put together some kind of coherent summary, um, or hopefully coherent summary of what we believe the Bible teaches. Um, it, it's, it's absolutely essential. When we run into questions in the Christian life, we don't just go, well, what does Philippians say about that? Yeah. We yeah. want to know about what God has revealed um, to us wholly. And so we need to have some kind of summary and the confession then functions that way in conversation then as we're receiving what's been passed down to us um, from the preceding ages. Yeah, and and just to just to rehit on something you just you just said is is you know it keeps us from having hobby horses because like you you have you have thirty two chapters in the case of the Second London thirty three in the Westminster 
And those chapters are representative of the whole counsel of God, you know, from, from first things, first principles, all the way to the last things. And so it, 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 it keeps us on track in that sense. It, it keeps us from going to, you know, uh, first Peter or second Peter. And, and, and then that becomes our book and, and just yeah. the interests in, you know, something like revelation or our interest in Daniel become really our, our interest in terms of our entire experience with theology. Um, and so I think confessionalism, you know, having a confession of faith, keep it, it guards us from ourselves in that regard. Um, yeah. and, um, and you're right, this whole, this whole thing where, uh, you know, our intellectual operation is confused or identified with the meaning of scripture itself is I, I think one of the, one of the perennial dangers that has, has, has been around and has been ingrained and has been, um, infused into the very DNA of movements like American fundamentalism, which started off with, you know, uh, good, good intentions, um, but I think along the way, there was a, a confusion of our, you know, fallible, finite human abilities with the magnificence, glory, and perfection of the Holy Scriptures themselves. And so you're right. You just, you just start to draw arbitrary lines because you're the, you're the, I, I, I mean, I don't know what else to call it. I, I think it's accurate. You're the, you're the Pope. You, you're, yeah. you, you know, you're making the, you're making the decisions as to what's important, what's not important, what the meanings of terms, paragraphs, clauses, phrases in the scriptures are, and um, you're building entire doctrines off of singular verses and so on and so forth. And, yeah. and, um, and so it's, it's good to, uh, to be in touch. Confessionalism is one way, I guess, to be in touch with, you know, uh, Christians throughout the ages so that we, yeah. so that we don't lose touch with them and then become totally inclusionary to ourselves and, and, and inwardly focused as to what we think the text means. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, that's uh, so key and it's so necessary. And, and really for me, how understanding a biblical, what I believe a biblical order of the church to be and the congregation's authority actually to hold accountable the ministers of the word. Uh, when, when there was false teaching in Corinth, Paul told the Corinthians to deal with it. He wrote to the Galatians mm -hmm. to deal with it, the churches themselves. And so how are they to do that? W upon what basis are our pastors to be installed into office and their teaching to be examined? Um, uh, w what's the standard? And, and I think the answer to that is, is, our confession. That's how oh, that I thought functions. you were. I thought you were going to say they need to get into a room and and re-exegete the scriptures, right? You know, and <laughs> and well, uh, you, you end up with that, and and you know what? And I talk to my friends that that deal with this in those kind of circles where individualism has been empowered in non-confessional circles, and you have endless controversies over. You preach this sermon, well, but I interpret this text this way, or this preacher interpreted this text that way. So you're, you know, you're wrong or heretical or whatever. Um, I never have those conversations because as long as my preaching and teaching is within the confines of our confession, it's right. It's it's fair game. Yeah. That doesn't mean we yeah. don't talk about things, of course, but you understand in broad strokes. And so, right. um, one of the ways I try to sell <laughs> confessionalism to uh, my brothers and in ministry and to fellow Christians is the liberty and freedom that it injects in the local church. Mm -hmm. And and we'll I'll often tell the members of my church said, look, if it's not written down in the Second London or part of our other governing documents, our Constitution, our Church Covenant then we don't have a formal position on it. And there's liberty here. And we're not going to make, uh, whether it's educational choices for children or uh, other issues of Christian liberty for the Christian life, those are not hills we're going to die on. We're certainly not going to divide on them in our church. And we can agree to disagree and we can have charitable discussions over them. Um, and, and it really, I think, brings an air of cultural, hopefully, liberty and freedom for both pastors and people uh, mm -hmm. in the church. Yeah, no, I think that's good. So that so that neither uh, the congregation or its leadership are are really unsure uh, as are are not only not unsure as to what's going to come from the pulpit or or but they're also but they're also not walking on eggshells. 
uh, right. around each other, right? Because because right. They, 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 you know, they either, if they don't agree, if the congregation doesn't agree with every jot and tittle of the confession, they at least have ascended to the fact that that's what they can expect to hear from the pulpit. So it's not going to come right. as a surprise whenever right. you, you know, you start um, uh, preaching through uh, Ephesians 4 or something like that. And, you know, you talk about the one body of Christ and, you know, uh, and, and, you know, polity and, and things like that. It's not going to come as a surprise because you have, you know, one of the longest chapters in the confession is, is on the doctrine of the church, chapter 26. And, right. and so um, anyway, I, I think that that's a healthy place to, to, to get us to uh, really our last, our last point here, which would be, and we've touched on it already and have alluded to certain issues that, that plague us now. Um, but the, the state of confessionalism today I mean, we because, and the reason I think this is an important question is because there are a lot of people, a lot of churches, a lot of institutions that would say we are confessional, but upon the final analysis, you know, what begins to happen is you find out that um, we're not so sure that uh, that person, church, or institution is being consistent with the the intent behind the terms used in you know, these confessions. So uh, um, yeah. it's led to a lot of confusion, I think. And it's, and it's, and it's, it's led to a lot of, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, obscurity in terms of, of, of what does it mean to, uh, you know, to, to be confessional, which we've already touched on, but, but really the state of confessionalism, uh, I would say is in, is in kind of a, a poor state today because of that equivocation on that, on that term and, and what it, what it means. So what do you, what yeah. are your thoughts on, on where we're at now? Well, before I, you know, address that, let me, let me preface by giving a story of when I, when I finished seminary and I started at a, a Christian relief organization um, and my immediate supervisor at that time brought me in and said, you're only going to be good for about a few months here. And I'm, what, what are you talking about? He said, you come with fresh eyes and we're all living in this world. We've all go accustomed to it. And so we know none of us any no longer notice the issues. And so I want you to be very observant and to be very lovingly critical about what you see and observe um, so that we can benefit from your fresh eyes. And I just thought that was an amazing. He's still that brother's still a dear friend today. It was an amazingly humble and um, self-aware comment on really the reality of when we're in something, you know, we become the frog in the pot and we don't notice we don't notice our own environment. Um, mm-hmm. And and so I, I mentioned that to say that is uh, when, when I start, you know, I've just told my, you know, story and my journey into confessionalism. And I know many brothers, you know, if I'm going to now give some things I'm concerned about in the circle, um, a, 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 a big objection they're going to state is, you know, you're a newcomer. What, you know, what do you have to say? And, and, and I, I still think the wisdom of my uh, friend and former supervisor is apt. And it's actually some of us who maybe are newer in the circles that bring some fresh eyes and that notice things that maybe uh, others of us have just become more accustomed to. And what I would say in general is after I left um, for, the, you know, a dispensational, more what we'd call in a right understanding, biblicist uh, background um, that was non-confessional, and I came into confessional circles, um, I was surprised actually at the similarities that stood out to me um, between the two. I'm actually quite surprised in many regards. Um, that I think in general, my read, and I'm open to be corrected, my read of the modern Reformed Baptist movement uh, in the 20th century moving into today is um, brothers that were rightly dissatisfied with the theology and the exegesis of, uh, you know, fundamentalist circles, for lack of a better word, and other circles. Um, And they came to different exegetical conclusions, non-dispensational conclusions, for example. Um, But yet they, and so they began to adhere to the second London, but I don't think the reality of what the theology and the hermeneutics both entailed in the second London confession and how that confession is to function um, in our ministries, I don't think that fully dropped um, 
in our camp in many quarters. And I still see some of the same uh, biblicist tendencies and practices uh, in our camp. Um, I see some of the attendant attention to personalities. Um, and and, and let's, be, let's be honest, this is true for every tradition and group. Unless we want to live in just unmitigated chaos, we will have a pope. And it will either be a person or a paper. Um, now, I'm going to put my, my money on a paper. And that's what I'm going with. Um, they are far more predictable and <laughs> far less likely to wreak havoc, especially one that's centuries old and is well proven. Um, rather, but, but we will have one or the other. And so there, it's really just a sense of where that emphasis is going to be. And I do think in some quarters of uh, Reformed Baptist circles, I think some of the failure to rightly understand the subordinate authority of our confession is shown itself in frankly, personality conflicts and personality uh, tribes. Um, and a lot of the, the pushback that I've gotten as of late in some of the criticisms that we've um, sought, think that are necessary in our circles related to the doctrine of God and, and sola scriptura really amount to little more than how dare you speak about this person. Mm. Um, and I have no, never any attention to speak of another brother of Christ, in, in Christ in malice or, or in any way that's um, uh, not recognize them as a brother. But, but I'm just bewildered when we have principled concerns and issues, we're defaulting to kind of an 11th commandment kind of deal. Um, I remember that from my old camp and <laughs> some of those circles. I'm like, I thought being confessional meant we were leaving that behind mm -hmm. and that at the end of the day, uh, we are going to put our uh, weight of emphasis on uh, what we receive and what we confess according to scripture. Um, and I think also we're, there are concerns of uh, just really issues of theological form formulation um, and the place of our confession as our hermeneutical starting point. Now that does not mean that we should ever, as, as pastors, so we're preparing, let's just talk about our, our, you know, weekly sermon preparation, week in, week out work. That does not mean I have a, a brain dead uh, approach to the Bible, or I don't care what the Bible says, and I'm just mm -hmm. going to recite a chapter of the confession in the pulpit. I, I never do that. And, and if you spoke to any member of my church or came and visited among us, they would say, we are committed to exposition of God's word week in, week out ministering the word of God. I think my confession actually tethers me to that very tightly. Um, but it does give me a starting point in the sense of uh, the faith once for all delivered to the saints is not, I'm not recreating that in my exegetical process in any particular passage every week. I have yeah. a, a starting point um, that is shaped by the tradition prior to me. Um, mm -hmm. And as I'm self-conscious of that, and as I'm aware of that systematically, confessionally, it aids me into a deeper understanding of, the, of what scripture says. Mm -hmm. And if I ever come to a place where I believe that there's some uh, fundamental substantive error in the second London, according to scripture, and I'm convinced of that, well, then scripture is going to win, period. Yeah. Um, there's clear, uh, the final authority is God's word. Um, but I benefit now that I don't start in just a nebulous framework and I come to scripture presupposing the confession um, and receiving that and using it as a guide and entry point into scripture. Now, I, I, you know, I don't, I, you know, we're talking things briefly and I, I don't want to paint again, any, any brother or any group of brothers as, as a straw man, but I do think that there is a, a tendency in even confessional circles. And I think it transcends, frankly, Baptists. I talked to Presbyterian friends that, or say they see the same thing in their communions. Um, but where the confession is on file, it's, you know, on the wall, as it were, we'll tip our hat to it occasionally, but it doesn't really function in my pastoral, theological mm. preaching work. Um, it's not something I'm utilizing. It's not something I'm self-conscious of. It's something I know I need to arrive at. It's not something I start with. And I, and I really think that that's really the debate I, I think we should be having, the discussion we should be having, is um, we're, we need to reform our hermeneutics, too. That yeah. uh, when, when, when we embrace the Second London Confession or we're in a confessional context, we're embracing a hermeneutical disposition that was prior to the Enlightenment, 
that was prior to the individualism and the mysticism and the pietism that came down from the 17th, you know, up into today. Um, and that had a different disposition to scripture and how scripture should be interpreted. Mm -hmm. And that we need to embrace that as well, because it's good, it's Christian, and it, it is um, going to benefit us by keeping hold of the doctrines that we confess in uh, the second London. And I would say just uh, maybe, maybe as a, as a concern and, and feel free to push back or curious your thoughts. I think we're pulling down what I see in confessional circles unintended. I don't think any brother's malicious. I don't know of any, you know, you know, evil plot, but there is an, uh, uh, an unconscious attempt at, or, or unwitting um, work of, of, pulling out the foundations of the doctrines we confess and we're actually mm. undermining the very means by which we um, um, arrive at our doctrinal confession and if we're not careful our children or grandchildren are not going to confess these truths right. um, because they're going to take the methods they've gotten and push them to consistency because we're still using the hermeneutics that are actually opposed to our confession or yeah. to maybe go back to how I started in terms of the tension I saw between historical theology and hermeneutics. I see, I still see that tension now present surprisingly in confessional circles where we're sort of lurching back to that hermeneutical disposition. That's really antithetical to what yeah. is present in our confession. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're exactly right. And it is an unwitting, I, I you know, I've called it and, and thought about it this way. It's a revision. It's it's a total revision, not only of, of doctrine, but of the first principles. Um, and, and maybe it's not even a revision of first principles by which we come to a grasp of these doctrines, doctrine of God, for example, or or specifically the Trinity or, you know, the Christology and Things like that is is the first principles aren't even considered because yeah. and, and they're not even considered because they're seen as these unscriptural extra biblical things. We need to stay with the scriptures alone. Interestingly, though, uh, it, you know, oftentimes within the same breath, it's let's go get the background studies. Let's try to get within the cognitive periphery of the human authors and the and the you know, the historically conditioned understanding of the audience and so on and so forth. And, and, um, and so the first principles are done away with, um, enlightenment, uh, instruments, uh, are applied, tools are applied, call them what, whatever, whatever you want, um, uh, assumptions, enlightenment assumptions. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then, you know, we, we start to slowly, and we've seen it just over the, you know, in, in recent times here is this unraveling, uh, of, of these orthodox truths that we've confessed and that Christians have confessed for generations going all the way back to the earliest, you know, centuries of, of the history of the church. And so um, it's a sad state of affairs and uh, much prayer and plotting, uh, you know, we will continue to do and hopefully the Lord will use that. Um, Pastor Steve, if you have any more remarks, um, or, or things to say uh, by way of, of wrapping up here. Um, it floor is yours still. So, um, I'm not sure what else to add other than just I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk and share. I hope everything I've talked about, I've, you know, it's been necessarily a points critical. It's always uh, my, my intention self-consciously is to help and to benefit. Um, I do think that we are in, however, a pivotal moment um, I think many of us recognize in our culture, in our nation, in the world. And, and I, and I think that the, the best place for us to stand is at the same, uh, metaphysical, theological, confessional, creedal place that our brothers and sisters withstood things far greater than mm -hmm. what we face in the history of the church before us. And I think what we've gone through, you know, I'm in a very, again, a very blue state here in California and what we've gone through and the conversations I have with my neighbors um, and the, the threats to um, uh, both, both real and, and, and ideological, the threats to the faith here uh, only confirm my confidence in being rightly confessional according to God's word and to standing where Christians have stood. Um, this is a faith that has been proven um, down through the ages. And we want to hold fast to that. And we want to be self-conscious of where we share um, 
ideological commitments with our unbelieving neighbors. And I think mm -hmm. that's an area that remains to be, we, we decry the expressive individualism in the LGBTQ movement. We hate what it's doing to our nation and to our culture. Um, but I think we need to be a little bit more self-conscious of where expressive individualism is present among us. Mm -hmm. And we want to root, root it out in, in, in every regard. We want to take every thought captive to obey Christ. And I think being self-conscious and confessing the faith with the church down through the ages is the wisest and the most biblical way for us to do that. And so that's really the spirit um, in which I, you know, share this brother. And I thanks for the opportunity and I do hope it'll, it'll, it'll help encourage and further uh, this really important conversation. Well, I appreciate you coming on and, and, uh, and sharing um, uh, your own experience and, and how the Lord has worked in, in your own life. And, and I, I'm sure that, like I said earlier, I'm sure that resonates with a lot of uh, brothers and sisters who'll be watching this and uh, certainly does with me. And, um, and so I appreciate that. So with that said, we'll go ahead and uh, close up here. Um, thank you guys for watching. Please consider subscribing to the channel, clicking the bell for continued notifications. Whenever new videos drop, you will get those notifications. And um, as always, please, uh, I encourage you to share the content. Uh, I'm sure this video will, will help and serve uh, those who hear it. So God bless you guys.